All right, so this is about to get awkward. But we've run out of chairs, and so I know you just sat down, but if you could stand back up and move towards the middle of your section and just help people find some seats, that'd be really great. Like I said, it doesn't have to be awkward, but it can be. Thank you. Hey, this morning, uh, as Brandon said, we're starting a new series uh, called The Final Verdict, and we're looking at the six uh, court cases, the six trials of Jesus. We're looking at a surprise seventh one on Easter Sunday, and today we're going to be talking about secrets and how Jesus didn't have any, but the uh, religious leaders did. And so what we wanted to do is, secrets are something that all of us kind of have, we all keep in some way, shape, or form, and we want to talk about the destructive nature of those secrets. So Dr. Brad Schwal, who is the founder and CEO of The Center, which is a counseling group, is here uh, today uh, to answer some questions about secret. How are you, Brad? Doing well, thank you. Awesome. So when I think about secrets, uh, I think about trying to keep people away. And so do secrets do damage to relationships with other people, my relationship to God, and even my relationship to myself? Absolutely. When uh, we have done something, crossed a boundary, made a mistake, or even when somebody has perhaps done something to us and we hold inside, we keep from sharing, we keep from being accountable or from confessing, then that separates out a part of ourselves that keeps us from living authentically, being open and vulnerable to healthy relationship, and we also miss out on our relationship with Christ and the grace and forgiveness that we receive, uh, even when we do have guilt. And so shame and guilt keep us from being truly ourselves. I found in, in the Psalms a, a psalm that talks about when we keep our transgressions from God, our bones waste away, we become weary. But when we do confess our sins, then God forgives not only the sin, but also the guilt. So confession is often, should be driven by conviction, but that can sometimes feel similar to guilt and shame. How do I navigate that? How do I know what's what? So guilt is uh, an emotion and experience when we have done something wrong, when we've crossed a boundary. It can be healthy. Shame is when we have a sense that all of who we are is not worthy. Shame is guilt that is taken on unnecessarily. It might be that somebody has done something to us and we take on shame that is not deserved by us or we somehow believe that it is our fault. So when it comes to guilt, we, we can make amends. We can ask for forgiveness. Uh, when it comes to shame, we can recognize that we all are worthy in God's presence and recognizing the fact that we are broken, that we will face difficulties in our lives, even that is freeing. And if we're dealing with depression or if you're dealing with addiction, that's not a secret to keep. Uh, that is help to seek. And so by freeing ourselves up, we can fully uh, grow and, and heal. So if I am sitting here or I'm watching online and I just heard something that made me think, wow, I, I want to talk to somebody. How can they contact you? How can they contact the center? How can they talk to somebody? Well, first, so important to have people in our lives with whom we can be real and with whom we can be honest. Uh, the therapist at the center are, are trained uh, to help you process, to help you think about your experiences. Uh, our therapists at the center are Christian, and we focus on faith and honoring faith so we can help in dealing whatever that shame might be or that guilt might be and help us to connect to God and others. The church website has a landing page for counseling that connects to our center. We have therapists here at the church as well as at our central office very close by and offices and churches from McKinney to Waco and Garland to Arlington. The centercounseling.org is our website, and that's where you can learn about our therapists who see kids, teens, and adults, the psychological evaluations we do. Uh, but we're honored to be able to be here in partnership with the church because it is so important uh, to help people understand we can't separate faith from any of our lives. And when we bring it in, it can help us to grow and to heal and to find full life. Absolutely. Brad, thank you so much for joining us this thank morning. You. Give Brad a big round of applause. There you go. 
So the thing is, we all, uh, I think, have secrets, right? We are all trying to keep secrets. Uh, and I think this is largely because uh, there is a version of me that I want you to see, and then there's a version of me that I don't want you to see. So I want to I wanna mitigate how much of the Travis Cook experience you get, right? I don't, you don't want Travis on full blast. No one can live through that. But I want to mitigate it. I want to make, make me more socially acceptable. I want to say the right things. I want you to like me. I want to do things that are approved. And in church culture, that gets doubled down, right? There are certain things we don't talk about, right? Baptists don't drink. We don't dance. And if you do those things, you better keep it a secret. Because we'll find out. I don't know how we will, but we'll find out. I want you to think of me the things that I want you to think of me. And secrets are a way, hiding that is a way to mitigate that. And so today we're looking at John chapter 18. This is the first trial of Jesus. And I want us to see the three things that secrets do to us, the damage that they create, similar to what Brad talked about uh, today. We're going to start in verse 19. And the first thing is this, secrets put us on the defensive. We're on the defensive when we have secrets. Verse 19 The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. And Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I've always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I've said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. Like I said, this is the first of six trials. Three of them are religious trials. One before Annas, the high priest. One before Caiaphas, the high priest. We'll explain that in a second. And one before the Sanhedrin, which is all the priests gathered together. Then there are three civil trials. One before Pilate, the governor from Rome. One before Herod, who's over the region of Galilee, which is where Jesus is from. And then back to Pilate again for the conviction. So that's, what we're, that's the, the, the march to, to Easter that we're going to go. Okay. Now, this first trial before Annas is probably less of a trial and more of like a grand jury. We're going to find out if we've got enough evidence to convict Jesus, not just on a religious sense, but on a civil sense. We want to find him guilty of crimes against Rome so that we can kill him. The Romans were the only ones that could execute people. And this is all incredibly shady. So this guy named Annas was appointed high priest in 6 AD by Herod the Great, the guy that was the king when Jesus was born. And after about 10 years or so, he's deposed. He's fired by the Roman governor who's Pontius Pilate's predecessor. And a new high priest is installed by the Roman governor. So you see the high priest is an incredibly political role. Well, because the Jews believe that only God can fire a high priest, many still consider Annas to be the high priest, the legitimate high priest. But his family starts to control the high priesthood. He has no fewer than five sons, five, who become high priest. His son-in-law also becomes high priest. His name is Caiaphas. And so during this time, Caiaphas is the Roman appointed high priest. But also during this time, Annas is still alive and many consider him to be the high priest. So it's almost like you say President uh, Clinton or President uh, Bush, even though they're not president right now, He's still the high priest. He's still awarded that title. And I hope you see what's happening. This is all incredibly shady, right? It's it's in the family, right? There's a lot of nepotism going on. And they do some crazy things. In Matthew 21, after Jesus throws over the tables, they get really angry and upset with Jesus. Most people think that Annas is the one who started the practice of selling the sacrifices on the temple grounds. It's lucrative for them. When Lazarus is raised from the dead, the priests plot to kill Lazarus. To kill a dead man. They're going to do it. And then we find out from extra biblical sources that Annas' son, Annas the Younger, he was the one who killed James, the brother of Jesus who wrote the letter James. He's the one who had him stoned. And so if I were to tell you about a family that was used a legitimate establishment as a front for their illicit operations. They put their uh, friends and family members in positions of power within the government. If they used intimidation 
to scare their opponents, if they intimidated their rival's family members, if they executed their, family, their rival's family members, you wouldn't think I was talking about a religious group. You'd think I was talking about what? The mob. And that's exactly what's going on. Annas has more in common with the godfather than he has with Mo- Moses' brother Aaron, who started the priesthood. This is what's going on here. And one of the things that the, uh, the mob thrives on is secrets, is secrets. You have that legitimate front. You have that, that persona that looks like you're a legitimate businessman, right? Businesswoman. But underneath everything, there's racketeering. There's all that other stuff happening. And you don't tell anything. You don't, you don't uh, snitch, right? Because what, what do snitches get? Stitches, that's right. You got people that that fall guys. You got people that don't betray the boss. And that's what's happening here. And what's amazing is you see the secretive nature of the priesthood. When do they arrest Jesus? At nighttime. They don't arrest him in broad daylight. They come at night. They bribe one of his followers in secret to get him to turn on him. And Jesus, Jesus calls him out on this. First, they ask him, hey, tell us about your teachings and your disciples. What does Jesus talk about? He only talks about his teachings. He didn't mention his disciples. Jesus doesn't snitch. Jesus doesn't give them any names. He doesn't say, well, you can go find Peter and ask him and John. Oh, and don't forget about uh, Judas. Uh, Oh, wait, you probably already know him. Uh, And just moving on and on. No, Jesus is quiet. He says, look, you're not getting those names out of me. But then also he says, he hasn't done anything in secret. He says, I've taught in synagogues. I've taught in the temple. I've taught on mountains. I've taught in villages. And because we're in Passover week, everybody's in Jerusalem. At this time, you probably couldn't spit in any direction without hitting somebody who heard Jesus teach. Witnesses are abundant. And we'll look at some of them next week when we talk about Caiaphas. He ate in scribes and Pharisees' homes. Jesus has been incredibly open and honest, whereas the religious leaders have not. They're underhanded. And you can only be this open and this honest when you don't have secrets. You can only be this vulnerable when you don't have secrets. You can only be this brave and courageous when you don't have secrets. But secrets make us defensive. This is why he's arrested at night, because the Pharisees or the the religious leaders are on the defensive. This is why they don't follow procedure. They're supposed to assemble witnesses and ask them. They don't do that. They go right to Jesus. We keep secrets. We have a lot of defensive strategies to protect our secrets. How many of you have passcodes on your phone? Probably everybody, right? I like the people who are like, I do. It's like, well, yes, of course we do. We all do. Right, of course we do. It's kind of a rhetorical question. You guys are doing great. And we use that. That makes sense, right? You've got uh, information on your phone that shouldn't get to, to people. Like you might have uh, pay, uh, your, your, your bank accounts. You might have text messages for work, like privileged stuff. It makes sense. But how many of us take that passcode, that face ID, and we use it to keep secrets from people that we shouldn't keep secrets from? We hide those text messages to that ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend from high school or college that you don't want your spouse to see. You hide those texts from that boyfriend or girlfriend that you're not supposed to have because your mom and dad say you're not old enough to have one yet. We hide the pictures that we looked at, the movies that we watched that we weren't supposed to watch, and we hide them behind a passcode and a face ID. I mean, what's the point of Snapchat? That's one, that's just a question. But two, (laughs) what is the purpose of Snapchat other than to keep secrets? The messages and the images disappear after a while. You can't tell me that secrecy is not one of, if not the only motivating factor behind that. Somebody, uh, other people, we have more, more elaborate 
uh, ways, defensive strategies, right? We don't always say what we mean. Hey, what do you think about my shirt? Yeah, man, that's a shirt right there. That's an ugly shirt, but it's a shirt, right? We embellish. We talk about a crazy story from back in the day, and we, we ham it up a little bit. That's okay. That's okay, right? Let's keep secrets. Other secrets are much more insidious and terrifying. Some of us are lonely, we're depressed, we're anxious, we're abused, we're addicted. And we hide that behind a warm smile, some pretty clothes, some good makeup, and some really carefully curated social media so that everybody thinks we have this picture perfect life. And when anybody asks, hey man, how you doing? Hey lady, how you doing? Our response is, we're doing great. Everything's so good right now. It is scary how easy it was for me to just slip into that. Because we keep secrets. Keep secrets. And there's really uh, two problems that being defensive like this creates. First is that you can't draw close to people. This is because when, when other people uh, are the people you keep secrets from, then you just have more people to keep secrets from. So you try to hold them at bay. You try to keep them away. They're enemy agents. So you have to keep track of who knows what and what lies have you told where. Benjamin Franklin said that three people can keep a secret if two of them are dead. You keep secrets. We can't draw close to people. We can't get near to people. It's because we avoid the accountability that Brad talked about. We need that accountability. We need someone to call us out. And we know that, but we hide from it. And what's worse is then we start hiding things from ourselves and we hide things from God, which sounds ridiculous, right? It sounds ridiculous that you could hide anything from somebody that knows everything, but we do because we bury it. We weave that story so many times. We tell that tale so many times. We cover up that secret so much that we legitimately believe that this is how things went down. And this is why confession is so important. This is the accountability part. Confession is so critical. You give other people, you give God the keys to your defense. You say, hey, I struggle with this. This is a weakness of mine. This is a temptation of mine. This is an addiction I have. This is where I've messed up in the past. This is what I'm tempted with right now. You don't tell that to everybody, but you have people in your life that you can trust. People that'll call you out on it. This is why you tell this to God. Basically what you have to do is you blackmail yourself. Because that's how you stay in the mob, right? You get involved early on with a little bit of crime. I don't know what a little bit of crime is, but you, you do the little thing. You're the wheel man for something, and then they're like, well, hey, you're just as guilty as we are. Again, I'm not in the mob, but I've seen it in movies, <laughs> and this is how it works. And then they're like, you're in too deep, man. You just got to stick with it. You've got to blackmail yourself. You've got to go to somebody that has all the codes to, to just nuke your life if they were to expel everything. And you trust them with it. And you say, hey, here you go. This is me. This is everything. Hopefully, it's a spouse if you're married. Hopefully, it's a roommate, somebody that's invested in your life. It doesn't have to be that person. But if you have secrets and you're on the defensive and your defensive fail, then you'll move into the offense. Secrets put us on the offensive. Look at verse 22. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, is that how you answer the high priest? And Jesus answered him, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. One of the officers, officers, hits Jesus across the face. The Greek says it's just an open-handed slap across the face. And I, I use the word officers in quotations because this isn't something that an officer should do. Their court was much like our court in that if you disrespected the court, what happens in our day? You get held in contempt of court, right? And that's a charge that's leveled against you in addition to other things that you're facing. So that's what should have happened here. But instead what happens is they hit him 
And again, it seems more like a mob movie. You don't talk to the boss like that, right? They're going to rough him up a bit. You don't sass him. You speak respectfully. And Jesus' response is, he knows the rules. He's like, look, if I did something wrong, investigate it and hold me in contempt. But if I, what I said was okay, why are you hitting me? It's not okay in any sense of the word. Jesus turns it around and saying, they're the ones who are disrespecting the very traditions that they're trying to uphold. And essentially at the end, Annas realizes this isn't going anywhere. Let's go get the, the high priest. Let's go get Caiaphas, the one that's actually in office. And I want you to see that this is a change in the way that they handle Jesus. Because every other time, for the most part, when Jesus has challenged them, have bested them in a game of words, have proven them to be hypocritical, fakes, whatever it is, they back off. They stew, they get frustrated, they get angry, they plot and they plan, but they don't actually do anything in most cases. But the slap across the face is an indication that they're not giving up this time. They've bribed somebody, they've arrested Jesus, it's night, they're not giving up until they get a conviction. They've switched to the offense. I mean, this isn't even the worst thing that Jesus has called them. He's called them brood of vipers, blind guides, whitewashed tombs. What he says here is incredibly mild compared to that. He doesn't get hit for what he said here. He gets hit for all the other things he said. They're on the offensive now. They're trying to control the narrative. They're trying to control what's happening. They're trying to control the image of themselves in front of everybody else. And at some point, your secrets will cause you to go over to the offensive as well. Again, thinking about the mob movies, when a journalist or a detective gets too close, finding out some critical evidence, what does the mob usually do? Somebody in the first service says they kill them. And I was like, okay, we'll tap the brakes. Not quite yet. They usually send them a warning, right? Like, hey, back off. And it's not like a kindly worded email. They're like, to whom it may concern. You have discovered that we have such and such and such and such going on. Please kindly desist, respectfully, Marlon Brando or whatever. No, 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 no. They do like, they like blow up their car right as they're about to get into it, right? Like that's what happens. Or they like shoot up their house, right? It's, it's just very poignant. It's like, back off. You're getting too close. We do this too. Hopefully not quite as mobstery as that. If that's what you're doing, it's just way, no, mm -mm, stop. But when our secrets get found out, we switch over to the offensive. When people find out that we're not the person that, that we've been projecting to be, we go over to the offensive. And this is because our secrets act as a bodyguard around this image that we're trying to project to the world. This person that we're trying to communicate. Winston Churchill said that truth in war is so precious that she must be surrounded constantly by a bodyguard of lies. It's a great quote. We replace the word truth with our self-image, and we surround our self-image with a bodyguard of lies. I want you to believe certain things about me and believe them to be true so that I can project to you this image of myself and you think really nice things about me or you're scared of me, or you're intimidated by me, whatever's useful to me, that's the image I want to project. And so when this gets found out, when our secrets become revealed and we're exposed as not being the person that we showed ourselves to be, that's when we switch to the offensive, which looks like this. We blame people. How many of you have done this? Either you are in school currently, or you have been in school, and you're, you're not doing so well in a class. And you've got the option. You can say, I can either tell mom and dad about this, or I cannot. And when you get found out, because those grades always come home, you get found out and they're like, why didn't you tell us you were having such a hard time in such and such a subject? Your, our response is always the same. We say, I just didn't want to make you guys mad. Or I didn't want to disappoint you. We blame them, right? This is your fault. I hit it. Because you get so angry about letters on a page. Kids, it doesn't work. Don't use it. We also blame people. We say, oh, well, well I, don't, uh, I didn't tell you about this because you get so worried about everything. So, honey, I just didn't tell you about it because I didn't want you to worry about it. 
or we deflect, right? We use other people's secrets against them. So it's like, well, hey, we were both talking about this person. Why did you rat me out? I didn't tell that other person what you said about them. I kept your secrets. Or we remind people of things that they've done wrong. We say things like, hey, I didn't tell you that I spent $1,000 on golf clubs because last year you didn't tell me that you spent $1,000 on clothes or whatever it is. That's how we work. We go to the offensive because we want people to get their eye off of the falsehood that we've shown ourselves to be and instead look at their own failings. If they're looking at themselves, they're not looking at me. And I can recreate the narrative. We are less people when we are keeping secrets than we are PR firms that are constantly 24-7 navigating and cultivating an image. And when you go over to the offensive, it's like a mudslinging campaign. You're just trying to drag everybody into the dirt with you. You're trying to control the narrative. Jesus' ancestor, David, does this. He does this really well. He sleeps with Bathsheba. She becomes pregnant. And he's like, oh, I got to do something because I want to continue to have everybody think of me as the man after God's own heart. So I'm going to bring Uriah, her husband, home. He's going to sleep with her. And then I can pass the kid off as hers. Problem solved. Or his, sorry. And Uriah, darn it, an honorable man. He doesn't go home. He stays in the barracks. He refuses to go home because while his soldiers are out fighting, he's not going to enjoy the comforts of home. And so David switch from, switches from the defensive to the offensive. I'm going to kill Uriah. And I'm going to still look like the good guy because I'm going to bring this grieving widow into my home. And it backfires on him. He gets found out. He gets exposed. Here's the thing. We really love to believe our own secrets because we love the image that we've created of ourselves. We are in love less with ourselves than we are with the character that we've created that we want people to buy. And when that person gets found out as being false, as being fake, we actually grieve over them because it's like somebody is dying. This fictional character has died and we'll do anything we can. We'll fight for our lives, not our lives, but the life of this falsehood in front of me. And so there's two things that we can do to fight this because we need to be consistent internally as we are externally. That's a way we battle secrets to be consistent internally and externally. That's one of the things that Brad and I talked about this week. And the first thing is, you actually need a secret life. Hold on, Travis. You just said secret lives are bad. Now you're saying you need one. I was reading an article this week about pastors who had fallen, who had failed because they had some secret sin in their lives. And one of the things that it said was, the person wondered if their secret prayer life had been greater than it was, they wouldn't have had this other secret life. You need a secret prayer life. You need a, a prayer life where you can be totally honest before your creator. Bare bones. Hey, this is what I'm going through. This is what I'm like. God, I need you. And if you can't accept me like that, I know you can because scripture tells me that you can. I have to believe that you can accept me like that. In the first service, I was sitting over here and I was super distracted during worship. Incredibly distracted during worship. Got a lot of things going on. Got the interview this morning. Had two sermons. Like all this stuff. Just going crazy. And I couldn't focus. And the words we were singing, you deserve the glory. You deserve it all. And I was like, I'm not giving you 1% here. Forget about all. And I kept trying to focus. And finally, towards the end of the last song, I just kind of fell into it. And I was like, Lord, I, I can't focus. And I need your help to focus. I want to, but I can't. And I'm sorry. You deserve better than that. But I'm so glad that you were a God who takes a broken person who can't worship right despite having been in church all his life. And you'll still hold me up and I can still cry out to you. And you know what happened? For the last little bit of that song, I actually started worshiping. Be honest about who you are. If you can be honest before your creator, you can start to be honest before his creations. Secondly, you've got to control the narrative. Okay, Travis, you just said controlling the narrative was bad. Now you're saying to do it. What's going on? One of the ways we control the narrative is that we put forward our good things, the good things we do, the good works, the good efforts. What if you put forward your weaknesses, your failures, your challenges? Because out of that, out of that weakness, 
then you can praise the Lord. You can say, hey, I'm not good at this, but God really showed up. He did something amazing for me. Other people will feel able to expose their secrets to somebody who's been vulnerable with them. It's very hard to be honest with somebody that you don't feel like you can relate to. I think it's one of the reasons why we have a hard time being honest with Jesus. He's like, he's perfect. He doesn't know what I'm going through. But Hebrews says he struggled just like we struggle. He didn't sin, but he struggled. He was tempted. So secrets put us on the defensive. They put us on the offensive. And they keep us in the dark. They put us in the dark. Look at Ephesians 5.8. We're going to go to one of Paul's letters. Just one verse. Ephesians 5.8 says this. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. One of the things about secrets that we haven't talked about is that keeping secrets, making secrets, being in the dark, this cloud of darkness around us is as natural to us as breathing. I've used this in an illustration before, but it works. Why is it that you don't have to teach children when they're up to no good to be really, really quiet? They do this instinctively. Like the more evil they are up to, the quieter it is in the house. It's the calm before a very messy storm. We learned to be secretive from our first parents, Adam and Eve. When they ate the fruit, when they fell, when they disobeyed the Lord, you know what happened? They did the defensive and offensive thing. First, they went on the defensive. They hid, right? Fig leaves, covered your nakedness, and... They hid. They hid behind some bushes. They hid from God. And when God finally finds them out, what do they do? They go over to the offensive. They blame everybody. Adam blames Eve. Eve blames the serpent. Oh, and Adam also blames God. He's like, God, the woman that you put in here with me did this. They blame. And we learned it from them. We learned every time you have a secret, every time you hide something from somebody, every time you know you should confess and you do not, you know what happens? You return to the garden and not the garden of flourishing and beauty. You return to that moment in the garden when Adam and Eve realized they had fallen, when they had, when they had decided they were going to hide from their creator. You're just recreating that moment. But praise God that there's another garden. There's the garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus, the night that he's arrested, the night that this trial happens, he is in there and he's praying and he's in anguish and he says, God, I don't want to do this. Father, let this cup pass from me because he knows it's going to be agonizing to go through it. But whereas Adam and Eve failed, Jesus prevails. And Jesus' very private, secret victory in the garden leads to his very public victory on the cross and at the tomb. And he does this to set us free from our secrets. He does this to get you out of that web, to get you out of your, your, your nest of secrets so that you can be real, so you can be alive, so you can be fully you. You see, I don't know if you know this or not, but we sit here and poke fun at Annas and Caiaphas and call them the mob. Guess what? You and I are in the mob too. We keep secrets too. Wasn't it Goodfellas where they become made men? You're made. You're a part of the family. Jesus doesn't die for, for, our, for his conspiracies. He, wasn't, he didn't have one. He died for our conspiracy. He's the fall guy for our conspiracy. And the irony is that Jesus didn't, didn't die for his cover-up. He died for ours. This may come as a shock to you, because you may sit there and be like, I'm a good person. I'm not a criminal. I'm not in some kind of cabal. I'm a, I'm a good person, and I work very hard to, to make sure that I'm a good person. I want people to think of me as a good person. I probably can't convince you otherwise. If you've had that narrative in you, is that the image that you're projecting? I probably can't penetrate that on my own. I pray that the Holy Spirit does. That's his work, not mine. But I do have a quote that I'd like to read you from uh, Dostoevsky, who's one of my favorite authors. He says this about good, decent people. He says, there are certain things in a man's past which he does not divulge to everybody, but perhaps only to his friends. 
Again, there are certain things he will not divulge even to his friends. He'll divulge them perhaps only to himself, and that too is a secret. But finally, there are things which he's afraid to divulge even to himself, and, even, and every decent man has quite an accumulation of such things in his mind. I can put it even this way. The more decent a man or a person is, the larger will the number of such things be. The better of a person you are, the more secrets you have to keep. Because odds are you like that people think you're a good person. And so you have more things to hide than anybody. And I know this to be true because I'm a good person too. Guess what? Jesus wants to set you free. Not so you can be a good person or a decent person. He wants to set you free so that you can be redeemed. The plan that Jesus has for you is better than whatever image you've created. Whatever idea you think you have for yourself, Jesus wants to make you into something even more than that. He wants to set you free from your secrets by putting your faith and trust in him. You can be set free from this web of secrets that you've created. You gotta put your trust and faith in his death, his burial and resurrection. That's why he died. And then you can be honest. You can be honest about what you were. You can be honest about who you are and you can be honest about who you might become one day. The coolest thing about secrets is this. The whole time you're spinning your webs, you think you're the spider. And when it comes down to it, guess what? You've been the fly all along. Let Christ cut you free from the webs. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for cutting us free. And every time that we try to spin a new web, we can go to you. We can confess to you and you'll cut us free again and again and again. And sometimes, Lord, if we've held secrets for a long time, there's pain that comes with that. There's hurt. There's other people that we have to seek forgiveness from. Lord, I pray that in those, the eyes and the hearts of those people that we have to confess to, I pray that there would be grace, there'd be your mercy, there'd be your forgiveness. Set us free, Lord God, from our secrets that we might be free in you. It's in your name we pray, amen.